List of Republic Species 1. Urukari. Both myself and shiphead Yulina are Urukari. We are omnivorous, but according to Dr. Zickler, we're allergic to fish and wheat, and will die if we ingest soda. Tim says we're humanoid. 2. Iceland. Mammals. They have four arms and two legs. I don't know if that counts as humanoid. Very short fur covering everything but their faces. Don't pet them. 3. Juntor. Amoebic people who use mechanical limbs to get around. They were uplifted by the Iselin before the Iselin joined the Republic. They really like to eat mulch. They also absolutely love to talk about music, but they have a cultural thing against listening to music with other people. Related to their courtship rituals, I think. 4. Duliki, very similar to humans, but their bones come out of their face, on their eyebrows and their chins. They're very sensitive to comments about their face bones, so it's best to just avoid the topic altogether. Unless they ask, in which case vague compliments are necessary. If they ask for specifics, they are trying to start a fight and the subject should be changed unless you want to fight them. 5. Malto Variakina. They don't have heads. Their voices come from somewhere in their torso. Translators have a tough time with most of them, so they tend to stick to themselves, might be blind. They also have two limbs which they use for locomotion and grasping. They were uplifted by the Duliki after the Duliki had joined the Republic, which was illegal to do. It was very scandalous. 6. Medkapens. These guys have two mouths and four eyes. Otherwise, they're pretty humanoid. One mouth is for eating and the other is for burping. Both can talk. They have multiple sacs on their chests which contain digestive enzymes that help them eat stuff. They have to leave the sacs mostly exposed to air for ventilation, and they consider it rude to stare at their chests. 7. Kinran, as Corporal Simmons would say, bug people. Ten limbs, all with universal appendages. They can grab things with their feet and walk with their hands. They have compound eyes and a thorax. They are herbivores, and pretty gentle despite looking like the stuff of nightmares. Don't act like they're the stuff of nightmares, though. That's very mean and they're super sensitive. 8. Oyan. Avians. They bear a striking resemblance to the new news of the United Systems. If Corporal Simmons hadn't told me about them before I got to the Thanatos, I would have been convinced they were the same thing. The only difference is that the Oyan have a spinal ridge, but you can't really see it unless you look hard, which is why I asked to look at Nav Officer Tlockney's back, I swear. It had taken Kryn almost two days to compile her dossier, and she had given me a copy to brief me on what information she was giving the United Systems. Unfortunately, she had given it to me after she had given it to Director 3 and Omega. She had also given it to many of the captains at their request. I made a mental note to have a discussion with her about professionalism, but was also glad that she felt comfortable communicating with the humans in such a friendly manner. I reread the dossier. It's not as if she were wrong about any of the information. Well, except I'm pretty sure Dr. Zickler had specified something called baking soda and had clarified that whatever normal soda is would be fine for us to consume. While Crean had compiled her dossier, I had been in talks with Director 3 about what to expect when we enter Republic space. We would reconvene with the Republic and follow our first contact protocols. The best place to do that would be Alira 2, an out-of-the-way system of no strategic importance. It's close enough to the core systems that it shouldn't take more than a few days for a diplomat to arrive by warp, but far enough away that the Thanatos can't scan anything important. Not that they would, but the rules are rules. The other reason I chose Alira 2 is that it has a station with the ability to repair our FTL drive. I advised Director 3 that I likely wouldn't be in contact with them once docked, and first contact would probably be handled by the Station Master until an official representative arrived. Any face-to-face -face contact would have to be done aboard some sort of Republic diplomatic vessel. It was a pretty lengthy conversation. Elsewhere around the ship things were pretty tense. The United Systems was expecting an attack at any time, and there was no shortage of pressure on the engineering team to finish up the repairs on our ship. The biggest delay was furniture repair. I said the seats were fine, but apparently they meant the consoles and controls. I spent most of my time visiting my crew trying to keep morale up. A lot of us had lost friends and some of us had lost family. Most of the injured had made full recoveries, but some were having difficulties with shrapnel and broken bones. Cran was already able to walk around with some difficulty, which Crin was thrilled about. 
Tim showed her a video of an infant deer, and she had quickly pointed out the comparison to Kron. Turns out Captain Wong isn't the only organic being Tim likes teasing. I visited the morgue, where our dead had been vacuum-sealed and frozen for preservation. I had visited them every day since we boarded. Six caskets sat silent, a testament to my command capabilities. Every day before Chow I came here apologized and wondered if I could have done anything differently. It hurt, but part of command is knowing that you have to do better next time. What made it worse was that there should have been ten. Four of my people were floating in the void and only the sun knows where. They would only get ceremonial funerals. I hoped their families would grieve for them without breaking. My aunt had drank herself to death after my uncle died. He had been on the wrong side of an airlock malfunction and had been shot out before anyone even knew what was happening. Since it was a trade station, their sensors couldn't find his body. Being able to see your loved one's resting face was painful, but at least it brought a certain closure. Part of me dreaded going home and having to write to the families. I wished there was a way I could bring them back, or stay here in Seoul or die to the OU. Anything to avoid the worst part of a shiphead's duty. Once I finished my contemplations, I went to Chow. They had a wide variety of food, and I found myself drawn to something called Spaghetti Americani. I was told that it contained wheat, however, so I grabbed something called a salad. I sat with a human who had grabbed the same thing so I could watch how to eat it. She looked a lot like Captain Wong, but something was a bit different about her face. I couldn't quite place it. First, you use your fork, that's the one with the prongs, to give it a good stir, she politely explained. Like this? I asked as I mixed the ingredients with my fork. Exactly. Now you take the container there, yes, that one, and you empty its contents over the salad, yes, like that. Thank you, you're very kind. No problem, she smiled, turned back to her food and whispered, I humbly receive. I felt like I was witnessing a personal ritual, so I turned to my own meal. Leafy greens with orange roots that were sliced thinly and bits of meat were now covered in an orange sauce called salad dressing. I took a bite and was surprised at how flavorful it was. I tried each bit individually and found that the flavor was coming from the orange root, the dressing, and the bits of meat. The leafy greens were just as flavorless as they were back home. The next day I had decided to visit the gym at the invitation of Lance Corporal Johnson when I was interrupted by a message. The repairs of the Loalana were complete, and they wanted my crew and I to prepare to board. Tim helped me brief everyone, and I headed for my ship. When I got to engineering, I was greeted by Plinus. He beamed at me and said, We finally got her up to snuff, except for the FTLD, of course. Everything else is just about good as new, I think. Thank you, Plinus. I can't wait to take her for a spin, I replied as Kryn jogged up to meet us. Shiphead, everyone else is on their way. It's going to take some time to load the injured. Looks like I got here first, she grinned. Permission to come aboard? No, I got here first. I returned her smile. Permission granted. I remained at the gangway and greeted the rest of my crew aboard. I somberly waited as the injured and dead were loaded aboard as well. Captain Wong and Lieutenant Babanin had come to see me off. They raised their hands to their foreheads. I mimicked the gesture and boarded the RSV Loalana for the first time in days. I was struck immediately by how clean everything was. The Loalana was a pretty old vessel and over time some grime had become somewhat of a fixture. Not anymore, though. I wondered if the United Systems had ship detailing services I could occasionally use. I did a quick inspection of the ship before heading to the bridge. Everything looked better than it had before we got attacked. Eventually I got to the bridge and it did not fail to impress. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear they'd even reupholstered my seat. Shiphead Eulina, are you and your crew settled in? Captain Reynolds said over the comm. Yes, Captain Reynolds. Thank you for everything, I responded. Not an issue. Always happy to make new friends. Prepare for warp. I looked at Lena and Kryn with a smile. They practically beamed back at me. Time to go home. Iratona 3 was a pretty boring assignment most of the time. Occasionally we'd see something weird, but it would always either be somebody under the influence or a rock. In theory, we were a military scouting station designed to watch deep space for enemy contacts, but we were on the wrong side of the Republic to be getting any action. The Omni Union would have to go well out of their way to get to us, and it genuinely wasn't worth it. 
We weren't guarding a colony or anything important. We were just here as an early warning system for the populated systems that you would have to warp through us to get to. I reckon that an enemy probably wouldn't even exit warp on their way through. That's probably why we didn't have any assigned military vessels. Just scout ships and station defenses. Scout ships are about half the size of normal corvettes and don't have even half as much ordnance, so they're just about useless in a fight. The only real time we see military vessels is when they come for dry dock repairs, which isn't often. We've also got civvies. They stop off to trade with each other, fix their ships, and rest on longer journeys. The income the station makes from the civilian ventures is likely what keeps it running, if my pay were any indicator. I gazed out the viewport into the stars in quiet contemplation when the proximity alarm sounded. Unknown? Ma'am, unknown contact just exited warp right outside the system. Blinus, my Dooleaky second-in-command, said as he looked up at me. I looked at the readout. For sensors, they weren't really making any sense. They were definitely picking up warp leftovers and were definitely picking up an object. But if it weren't for the warp signature, I'd swear this thing had to be a small comet. It's too large to be a ship. But unless comets have secretly been sentient this entire time, they don't warp. We're gonna need a better look at this thing. Do we have any scanning vessels aboard the station that we can send? I asked. Blinus looked back at his console. Uh, no ma'am. They've all been sent out by high command. Something about warp fluctuations. Damn, I said as a thought occurred to me. Do we have any diplomatic vessels aboard? If this is an unknown vessel this large, it's either OU, in which case we're dead, or it's a first contact. Blinus shook his head solemnly. Looks like he already had the same thought. Many of the other species in the Republic would be losing their cool in this situation. But the Esalon and Du Leaky had something in common. We would much prefer to die in conflict than die in bed. Don't get me wrong, it's not as if all of us feel this way. And it's not as if we all always go looking for fights. But culturally, we are geared toward conflict in a way that's rare for other species. We don't have any of the diplomatic ones, but we do have a bunch of civvy ships that can do the job in a pinch, he replied. Might have to give them a good old spit polish, though. Well, that's something. Go ahead and wake up the station master. Yes, ma'am. As he ran off to complete his task, I looked back at the console. What the hell is this thing? Why did it leave warp so far away? Normally, that would immediately rule out OU. But I knew better than to think I understood those crafty bastards. Could this be a weaponized comet? Are they dumb enough to throw a big space rock at us? Probably not. Even this fringe station has enough ordnance to turn it into pebbles that our shields would make short work of. Then the object began to move toward us. It was moving fast for an object its size. I put two of my arms on my head to help me focus as the other two got to work on our scanners to track the object and hopefully get a better read on it. Intel Lead Nuffer, are you there? The Station Master's timid voice came over the comm. Station Master Nixt is a Kinran? The Kinran are known for being one of the least aggressive but most intimidating species in the Republic. This is because most sentients have fears regarding bugs that date back to when we were barely our own species. And the Kinran are particularly terrifying to look at. They have ten limbs which have four joints each. These joints don't function like elbows, though. They function as wrists. Very limber wrists at that. Watching one work at a station is both unnerving and impressive. Due to their scary looks and gentle nature, they typically don't rise in rank. Nixt was an exception to this. Despite his protests, he had been forced into the rank of station master by the previous station master. The old SM had been impressed with Nixt's work ethic and had demanded his promotion. Honestly, everyone on the station adores Nixt, from afar. Yes, station master Nixt, I replied. What's the situation? Blinus was speaking very quickly, and I think I heard something about a first contact, Nix said with a barely controlled panic. Well, an object the size of a small comet just exited warp right outside the system. As you know, comets don't warp. Actually, they can, if they manage to enter a wormhole, Nix began excitedly. A wormhole, yeah, yeah, I get that. And while that is technically a type of warp, it doesn't leave this kind of signature when it exits the other side of the wormhole. Also, the object was stationary for a time and is now traveling toward us. I interrupted. Oh, the station master said bleakly. And you're certain this isn't the Omni Union? Nope, not certain of anything at this point. But the OU aren't dumb enough to waste resources throwing rocks at us. 
Which means that, like it or not, this big boy is a ship. And if it's an OU ship, we're dead. Simple as that. So we might as well assume it's an unknown species and prepare first contact protocols, right? I said, beaming at how calmly intelligent I was being. The calm was silent for a time as the station master digested this logic. Poor Nixt. This was supposed to be an easy assignment. I guess there's no such thing. Finally, Nixt said, I can get behind that logic. While I don't cherish the idea of going down without a fight or going down at all for that matter, I must admit there isn't anything our station can do against a ship the size of a comet. A small comet. But you're right, I said as the proximity alarm sounded again. This time it pinged a friendly. I looked back to the console and saw a smaller object leaving the larger one. The scanners identified it as the RSV Loalana. Not a ship that I'd heard of, so I pulled up its service record. A bunch of it was classified go figure, but it wasn't due to report for another week. So they went on whatever mission they went on and found that. But why were they... Attached? Docked? Can you even dock two ships in warp? Before my head began swimming, I forwarded the data to the station master. Oh? Well, this is good news, right? Nixt said. Maybe? It's definitely one of ours, but I don't know what mission it was on or why it's with that ship. Could be that the big one caught ours and took it over, I replied. Or it could be that they were guiding it here in accordance with first contact protocol, but that doesn't explain why the sensors only showed the one contact at first. Either way, if they're alive, they've got one hell of a story to tell. Right. I could tell that I hadn't comforted Nixt at all. Okay. Okay. Well, we're still hoping for the best, right? Right, because otherwise we're dead, I responded. Right. Yeah, so we need to follow FCP. We'll need a diplomatic vessel. All right, I'm sure we can commandeer a civilian shuttle for the task, Nixt said. I'm sending Blinus down to the hangar to get started on that. Understood, I said as I glanced at the readout again. The alien vessel was trailing behind the Loalana, and they were about to enter comms range. What do you want me to do when they enter comms range? I asked. If they hail us, patch it through to me. If they don't, then hail them. Either way, I want to talk to the shiphead, Nixt said with a mask of authority hiding his obvious nervousness. I was immediately glad I asked because the RSV Lolana hailed us before I could respond to the station master. This is shiphead Uina of the RSV Lolana hailing the Eritona 3 station. Please come in, Eritona 3. I thumbed the key to answer. RSV Loalana, please halt your course and tell your accompaniment to do the same. We weren't expecting visitors. I'm putting you through to Station Master Nixt. Acknowledge. Acknowledged. As I transferred the hail to the Station Master, I watched the Loalana slow to a stop. It took about as long as it normally did. And the reason I noticed that was that the massive hulk of a ship stopped almost immediately. Great. Not only do they build bigger than we do, but they build better than we do. I secretly hoped that their braking thrusters were the only tech they had that was more advanced than ours, even if they joined the Republic. If they were advanced enough, it would cause a shift in the power dynamic that would be very frustrating for the other member species. A lot of people have this belief that seniority should matter, but it doesn't. When the Oyen had joined the Republic, their massive population and territory had caused them to have a lot of senators, and thereby a lot of influence more than most of the member species, and there had been a lot of unrest. But for a species to be represented properly, seniority couldn't matter. A species with a handful of systems and a population of two trillion shouldn't be allowed to tell a species with dozens of systems and dozens of trillions of citizens how to live their lives. The station master interrupted my thoughts on democratic representation. Knuffer, the RSV Loalana is going to need clearance to dock at the repair bay. Their FTLD isn't working. They'll also need access to the station. Ten special guests, eighteen standard guests, six shipments. Understood on it, I said. Special guests are wounded, shipments are dead. I don't know why we used code to talk about it. Maybe it was because it felt disrespectful or because calling them wounded or dead made it too real. Whatever the case, I found myself wondering how it happened. Was it the aliens? Also, the alien ship is called the USS Thanatos. Shiphead Yulina will be briefing me once they dock. I've given the go-ahead for the Thanatos to maintain distance. Not that they could dock even if they wanted to, Nixt continued. Yeah, they're way too big for that. All right, I'll keep an eye on them. Let me know what Yulina says, I replied. 
I'm certain it's going to be interesting. Yes, Nixt said. Let's hope it's interesting in a good way, though. I had warned the Thanatos that there may be delays in communicating with them because of our first contact protocols, but I still felt a certain sense of unease. I had let the aliens get my hopes up about our war with the OU. If they help us, we're damn near certain to win. But certain anxieties were haunting me now that I wasn't with them anymore. What if the United Systems decide to just go home? What if our diplomat messes things up with them and they declare war? What if they mess things up with the diplomat and we declare war? Shiphead Yulina, this is Station Master Nixt. Please respond. The hail saved me from further spiraling. This is Shiphead Yulina, I replied. You have clearance to dock at Repair Bay 2. Your special guests will be escorted to their quarters and your shipments will be delivered. Nixt said. Please come see me when you have a chance. Understood, Shiphead Yulina out. I hated the code words for injured and dead, and most places didn't use them anymore. It's only out of the way stations that still use them. I remember being told that they had originally been used to avoid a panic in case civilians were listening in on the comms. That would make sense except that civilians have the right to access, so they get to see our casualty counts in near real time. R2A has been around forever, so it was hard to imagine this crap was just a relic. Kron was injured and Jular, his off-shift, was dead, so I was manning the nav console. If it were standard maneuvers or even standard docking, pretty much any crewman would have been able to handle it. Internal docking is a bit more difficult. In theory, the computer knows where the dock is and where the ship is and where the clamps are supposed to go. In practice, it's usually off by an inch or two. That can cause damage to the ship and to the dock. So the pilot has to know where the ship is and where the dock is and where the clamps are supposed to go and make sure the computer doesn't fuck it up. It had been a few years, but it was still muscle memory. The computer was a tad too deep and it overcorrected our yaw, so I input the corrections and slowly docked the Loalana. Come to think of it, it hadn't even been docked in the USS Thanatos. It had been grabbed and scooped up. That still felt wrong on a very deep level. Attention all crew, I said into the intercom. We are officially docked at Iratona 3 in the Alira 2 system. While we're docked, you are off-duty, but you must remain aboard the ship. I want you all on your best behavior. If you're good, it will be easier to get some shore leave approved. A cheer ran through the ship. Sure, they had just had a fantastic adventure aboard the Thanatos, and Iratona was likely to pale in comparison. But cheering at shore leave is tradition. I will be meeting with the station master as the repair crew comes aboard. Stay out of their way so we can have FTL back. I smiled as I paused for dramatic effect. Dismissed. Another cheer rang through the ship. I advised Lena that he had command and went to the airlock. As I walked down the gangway, I felt relieved that it wasn't a plastic tube and had gravity, unlike the last time I had exited the vessel. An Oyan engineer was waiting for me with a salute. Permission to board shiphead? she asked. Permission granted. Fix her up good, you hear? I smiled and returned the salute. Yes, sir, she said and moved to let me pass. I got my bearings and found the exit into the station proper. As I walked, I wondered where my escort could be. Surely Nix didn't expect me to just wander the station until I found him. I looked around and saw a dull leaky running toward me. I stopped and waited for him. Are you the shiphead? He asked between breaths. Yes, I'm shiphead Yulina. Nice to meet you. I paused, waiting for an introduction. Belinus. I'm with Intel, but we don't have a big staff, so I'm the errand boy today. Do you mind if we relax a moment? I've been running for a while, he said as he doubled over and rested his hands on his knees. I nodded and we waited for him to catch his breath. Once he was finished, he gestured for me to follow him. He gave me an abridged tour of the station that was limited to the path we had to take. He explained what each place was and gave a brief history about it. Once we were outside the station master's office, he turned to me. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but Nixt is a Kinran, he whispered. He's very nice, though. Don't be afraid, 